on this episode of The Naturist Living Show, Marketing Naturism. This episode of The Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Welcome, dear listener, to this episode of The Naturist Living Show. My name is Stéphane Deschaines, and I'm your host for this podcast and the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. And on this show, we are going to talk about just one thing, marketing naturism, marketing your naturist club, marketing the naturist movement. And uh, it's going to be a pretty long show. I have a lot of material to cover and to discuss. And so I think this, this is going to be the longest show yet. So uh, we're going to for sure exceed an hour. So settle down, listen to it in a few sections if you want. But it is an important topic that a lot of people have asked about and that they want to hear about and they've asked for advice on. So I am going to go through the whole thing. It's like condensed marketing course in one and a bit hours. So I thought we'd start with our now regular contributor, Felicity from YNA, and uh, I asked her to talk a little bit about her views about marketing naturism. So here you go. Hi, it's Felicity of Young Naturist America, back from my monthly segment. So first I thought I'd share my thoughts and Stefan's topic this month about advertising and marketing naturist clubs. And I'm going to be blunt. Most naturist clubs in the U.S. are really bad at this. They are particularly bad at using the internet for advertising and marketing. It's not the first time I'm saying this because as YNA, we've been very vocal about the lack of marketing savvy in the naturist world. But anyway, I guess the first step is recognizing that there is a deficiency. So obviously clubs use advertising because they want to attract new members and new business. But they should also know that good marketing and online presence will especially attract more young people. I will now share what we consider to be the most essential bits of advice on how clubs can improve in this area. First of all, most nudist club websites are poorly designed, and while the information may be up to date, they still look like they haven't changed since 1997. Many people, especially younger people, will quickly leave a cumbersome, outdated website. What clubs should know is that a website should not be treated like a business card. It's not just a page to just dump some information. It's the foundation of any business that wants to have a place in the future. It should be used to engage visitors, to network, and even create a community among club owners. It will cost some money to revamp a website, but a club really can't survive without a decent functioning site. Secondly, it seems like a lot of clubs and resorts are still investing money in print advertising. Print advertising is becoming obsolete with not enough return on investment to justify the cost. Online advertising is much cheaper and will allow you to reach a much broader audience. Plus, it has the potential to remain permanent by existing virtually online forever. Thirdly, many clubs are not using social media. The two big ones are Facebook and Twitter. These are both free and pretty easy to use, so why aren't more clubs using them? I'd really like to know. I think maybe it's because the owners or management don't know how to use them, or maybe they don't think it's important, or maybe they don't have a person or volunteers to take care of it. Well, it is important, and clubs should appoint someone to manage a Facebook page and Twitter account. I recommend that privately owned businesses hire a social media manager. That's what tons of mainstream businesses are doing these days because it's become so big. If you did hire someone, they could create a lot more accounts and even write a blog for your club, which is a very beneficial addition to a Naturist Club's website. Also keep in mind that social media should be updated regularly with good quality posts. That means writing more about about more than potluck dinners and skinny dips. Not that those aren't fun, but there's more to it than that. That's why a person should be given the task of managing it. 
By the way, some months ago, we actually created a group for nudist club and resort owners on Facebook called Nudist Business Owners. We created this group to try and lend support to club owners and for them to have a place to share ideas and strategies with each other. The group has unfortunately been dead, but we still welcome new people to join, to post questions, and to discuss what I've talked about in this segment. It's a totally secret group, so you can send me a message and friend request at facebook.com slash felicitynaturist if you want to be added to the group. And so this is all very basic advice, but the naturist world is so far behind in marketing and everything. I hope this podcast episode will inspire club owners to make changes to their websites and start updating their strategies to join us tech-savvy people in the 21st century. I have one last thing to share for YNA News. I just wanted to announce that our YNA Upstate New York chapter will be having their very first event on June 29th. It's a weekend-long retreat on a farm in Ithaca, and there will be a cooking workshop with a chef, some wine tasting, naked yoga, and more. So visit our website to check it out at nudistnaturistamerica.org. And so that's all for this month. So back to Stefan. Thank you, Felicity. Yes, I I totally agree. There's a definite lack of marketing amongst a lot of naturist clubs out there. And that's too bad because, um, you know, if somebody owns a naturist club or if uh, they run a naturist club, if it's a co-op, somebody has to be uh, appointed or elected uh, to run the club, they're in the business of marketing. Um, And uh, they may not be an expert in all those areas, but hopefully they have a good sense of what marketing is about. But yes, sadly, it does seem to be lacking in a lot of clubs. So... We're going to go a little further um, than Felicity. She gave some very good, specific advice, and she's very right about it. The Internet is the place to market. It's such a boon for naturism because naturism is such a niche market. And before the Internet, it was so hard to reach people, so expensive, so difficult to get the information. Now with the Internet, it's actually simple. People who are interested can find it, and you can target people so easily, and you can do it very, very cheaply. Uh, in many cases for free. It just takes time and understanding what you're doing. So we're going to talk for the rest of this show, and it's going to be me mostly talking. We're going to talk about marketing. And uh, usually you don't listen to me. You listen to one of uh, the guests that I bring into the show. Um, but in this case, I think I'm fairly qualified to talk about this. I mean, I spent a lot of years working for advertising agencies, but also I've taken a club Uh, which was essentially uh, inactive with only a little over 100 members to well over 500 in six years and actually took less than six years to get there. And last summer we had um, over 2,200 visits by non-members, many, many of those being uh, people who had never been and never tried naturism before, the rest being people who, for whatever reasons, uh, chose to visit a few times but not take out a membership, but that's okay too. Uh, As you've heard in previous show, we have no problems attracting young people, and that's all marketing. So I'm going to be talking to you about my views of how to successfully market. And the fact you're listening to me right now suggests that I've managed to get enough people's attention um, that we now get regularly 50, 70,000 in previous some months, as I've said before, over 100,000 listeners to the show. So that's marketing, too. and, and that's one of the first things that I want to talk about, the difference between marketing and advertising. A lot of people use the two terms interchangeably, but marketing is much broader. Advertising is communicating your marketing message. It's getting people to learn about what you have, and it's very important, but it by itself is not marketing. Marketing by the traditional textbook definition is made up of five different items. First, the right product or service. And I think in the case of naturism, uh, you've decided on the service or product ahead of time. Is it the right one? Well, it depends on what, uh, who you're targeting. But even within that, there's a lot of deciding what you are selling. Uh, the biggest misnomer in what naturist parks are selling is campsites or swimming pools. Naturism, as we've discussed to death in this show, is a, a lifestyle, a philosophy, a movement, uh, it's full of ethical and moral consideration. 
you're selling an ideal. You're selling something much more than just facilities. Otherwise, you're competing against regular campgrounds. You're just a campground or a country club with a dress code or a different dress code or a little more tolerance of nudity. And that's not very powerful, particularly when you're trying to convince people to do something very difficult, which is to be nude in front of others. That's hard. That's very hard for reasons we've discussed in several other shows as well. So you have to have something that is powerful enough that makes people want to get over this phobia, this gymnophobia they have. You have to sell them a service that means something. So that's the right product or service. And we can spend a lot of time talking about that. In fact, we have in other shows. So I won't belabor that point any further. The second point in traditional textbook marketing is the right price. Well, what's the right price? Well, I don't think the right price personally is the cheapest price. I've heard many people say, oh, and naturism, you can always stay in a naturist park cheaper. Well, that's wrong. It shouldn't be cheaper, in my opinion. If it's cheaper, why? Is it cheaper because it's less? Well, in a lot of cases, it is less, but that's a whole other discussion. Pricing is key and important, and that's a whole discussion. Uh, I mean, you have to take into consideration competitive factors, what people can afford, what they expect. I always compare myself to a round of golf in the area, and we're a lot cheaper than a round of golf, and I think we provide more, so that's the right price. Number three in traditional marketing are the right quantities. Not really relevant here, although in the case of Bear Oaks, we are out of uh, campsites for people who want to, to keep their trailer there the whole season or the whole year. In fact, there's about a 10-year waiting list right now. By the way, there was um, probably two-thirds of them were empty when we bought the park you know, six years ago. But now there's such a demand that uh, we're out of sites, and that's a bad thing, and that's a whole other... that's an operational issue and we don't have the money at this point to invest to build the sites it takes a lot of money and time so we won't worry about that but that's the number three not that important for marketing discussion here the right place that is uh you know in traditional uh package goods marketing the right place and as a marketing idea is that you put it on the shelf or you sell it in the right store uh, but in the case of our service or our product um, you have to be in the right location. If you're too far from where people live, then you have a different business. If your business then is, uh, for example, if you are uh, in Saint Martin um, and you have this beautiful resort called uh, uh, on Orient Beach called Club Orient, then you are selling vacations. You are probably not making your business on day users as we do at Bear Oaks. Over 65% of our members are day users because they can drive in less than an hour and spend the day at the club. They don't need to stay overnight. But if you're club oriented, then you're selling in that case uh, towards an overnight. And so the right place in that case, because it is uh, a destination is going to be even more incredible. So you have the ocean and the beach and the the place to stay that make it a fabulous place. The same thing with Montalivet, where we're going in July for our trip, uh, our group trip that we've organized. And they are in the dunes and they have, uh, you know, a beautiful ocean and views and nature. So because they're a destination. So that's the right place in that case. And finally, the fifth element in more traditional textbook marketing definition is the right time which means that you're, you know, presumably it's like selling uh, naturism in the middle of the winter and not in the summer. Although you actually want to start selling it in the spring when people are starting to think about it because this is a high involvement decision to try it for the first time. Uh, I never market to existing naturists. I'm always trying to find new uh, naturists because otherwise that's why we talk about a shrinking uh, market and a shrinking uh, business in naturism. So we are always trying to market ahead of time to give people time to think. In fact, it can take years to get there. So when you, are, you have all those elements of marketing figured out in terms of what you're selling, then you have to decide who you're selling it to. And that, that's the target group. And to a certain extent, that's going to define the pricing, um, the place, the time, the product even that you're offering, right? The, who is your target group? Who are you selling your naturist service to? And we talked about how different groups have different expectations. So if you want to attract young people, they have less budget. Um, they're busier. They have certain consideration. People with children have certain consideration. People who are retired have different consideration. Um, you can target, fundamentally, you can target in two ways. You can target your existing group, 
you you look at who's at the club right now or at your resort and you say this is my target group because these are the people that like us now and that's very valid that's using targeting your to your current strengths you're strong with a certain group the problem with most of, most of these clubs and is out there that are complaining about shrinking is that they are older and so they are targeting only to older clubs and older people and they're providing services that appeal to older people the other option is to target desired groups that you don't currently have. Uh, now, there you're marketing to your weakness. So why are you weak? Well, there's two options. You're weak in that area because your product or services does not appeal to that group. Or you're weak in that area because you've never successfully convinced them to come to you or buy your product, buy your service. So why, you know, with young people, I think it's very clear that young people... Um, can be convinced to try naturism, do enjoy naturism if you're offering the right product, the right service, and you're reaching them and convincing them to try it. So it's definitely can be done. But um, you have to be careful um, because um, it's very tempting to only market to your strength. It's okay. It's strong. You know you're good at targeting the group you currently have. That's okay. Certainly, certainly that can be the low-hanging fruit, the easiest people to market to because you understand them and when they come they're going to see people uh, that are like them and they'll enjoy being there but it can be a trap because you can convince yourself that that's the only marketing you can do you can convince yourself that young people aren't interested if you have a, a, a club full of older people you can convince yourself that children uh, and parents will aren't a right target in naturism and there's a club that uh, i was talking to the owner and they had taken out their playground why because it was unsafe they said well are you not replacing it no we have no children here well of course if you have no children and you take out the playground you will never have children or you're certainly not making yourself children friendly um, the rationale for them was that the older people have more money and more time to spend in the club and therefore spend more money and that's probably true but my point of view is um, I, I, we, are, we have older people as well. So I'm not against uh, marketing to older people or, or selling naturism to older people. But younger people, if you get them when they're in their 30s and they're just starting their family and they, they raise their children there, they are going to be there much longer than the older people. And then therefore, over the lifetime, they will spend more money. And you will create a continuous uh, circular flow over a century, if you will, of people from young to old, and there'll be always a mix. Um, you know, with children, if you keep the children happy and the children love to be there, then the parents are happy. Because when you have parents, you're trying to keep your children happy and have a good time because you love your children, and sometimes you're looking for a little peace, and if they're happy, they don't bug you. <laughs> so, you know, the beach, the playground, the toys, the activities, these are the kinds of things that parents are looking for. And if you want to target younger people, that's what you have to consider. So the important part and the most important part where every, I think, loses focus in a target group is, remember, we're not Coca-Cola. And what do I mean by that is we don't need to reach everybody. If you look at companies like Coca-Cola, they have to sell to almost every single person on the planet in order to keep growing and in order to keep their market share. It's a product that is supposed to appeal to almost every single person, the lowest common denominator, very generic advertising. And so they have to spend a lot of money just on branding, reaching the whole world. It's very, very expensive. With naturism, you're not trying to reach everyone. You're trying to reach a very small percentage are interested. And if you can get 1%, that's probably pretty good. It's like the assumption that, you know, all young people want to party all the time. Well, I know lots of young people who don't want to party all the time. I know young people who don't like to use Facebook. I know young people who don't like to use their cell phone. You, n there is no one type of young person that you can define. There's no one type of person who becomes a naturist either. But in the example of Bear Oaks, in our example, we have about 6 million people within one hour's drive of us. So if I got 1%, that would be 60,000 people. Well, that's way too much. I'm not looking for 1% because I couldn't handle 6,000, never mind 60,000. So you have to keep your expectations in check. You have to 
focus and realize that you're not going for 50% or even 20 or 10% of the population. You're looking for maybe, it's probably less, but maybe 1% of the population that is, well, shall we say, smart enough, open-minded enough, educated enough <laughs> to understand that naturism is a better way, uh, that naturism is a better life and a life philosophy that could make the world a better place. But for now, you know, maybe in a long time from now, we'll be able to talk about much bigger target groups. But for now, in, in anywhere in North America, and uh, most of the world for that matter, 1% would be incredible. And uh, so... Other than the few European countries, that would be a huge impact on the population in terms of the influence of naturism. So, when you pick your target, you have to try to decide what do you want, what do you need, what do you want to reach. There's no point, of course, in going after a difficult target. And again, back to that 1%. You know, for example, there's no point in trying to target fundamentalist uh, Muslims because, you know, we know they have issues with covering up themselves. So, you know, that's a much harder sell. I'm sure we could convince some of them. I'm sure that's doable. There's always people that can be convinced in any group. But try to discover within your targeting who you want to reach and what they have in common. Um, and look again at the future, not just a short term. So one of the th things I've discovered is that people focus very much on demographics, age, and we've talked about young people, and, and they talk about uh, income, and they talk about things. Those are called demographics, income, age, education. What is far more important in naturism is psychographics, and psychographics is how you're thinking, your emotional state, uh, what you like, what you dislike. These are harder to measure but they're far more indicative of what people are looking for and what's going to make them go there. So, for example, I'm sure you understand that people who are into alternative medicines or into certain spiritualities and things like that are probably more open to naturism than your traditional uh, blue-collar worker um, who uh, works a very steady nine-to-five job um, and just believes in the, you know, likes the standard football and standard all things that you expect in your kind of typical profile, which is probably the mass of the population. This is probably the core of the population. So in that target, what are your psychographics? So how do you determine them? I'm not going to tell you what mine are. It doesn't matter because er different areas are different and you might decide you want to target a different group. But how I do it is whenever there's new people, my, I go talk to them. Why did you come here? How did you find us? What made you decide? I love to have those chats with people. That's how I get the insight about what to do next, what's working, what's not working. Not just as one or two questions, a real in-depth discussion. You know, I buy them a beer, we sit down, we chat. Uh, most people love to talk about it. They, this is new. They're excited. They love where they, why they're there. So they love to talk about it too. And I get an incredible amount of insight. And, you know, sometimes you might want to look at the people you don't want and find out why they're there as well. You know, uh, if we get people, we have people who are too loud, who come there just to party, um, who are not really interested in naturism. They just were looking for a place in that particular, in that particular situation to uh, have their party not be disturbed. They didn't want to take their clothes off. So, you know, trying to understand where they came from and why they found us is uh, important as well. But I will give you one warning with regards to listening to people. People don't always know what they want. You know, well, for example, if you ask people, uh, would you like to pay more for the same service? The answer is always no. In fact, most people would like to pay less and get more. That's normal. So do I. So... You can't always ask some of these questions. So in terms of pricing, some of it's a bit of ex experimentation in trying to understand what you're trying to influence. For example, we raised our day visit last year significantly, about over 20%. And the reason for that is a lot of people were not taking out memberships and uh, because it was cheaper to just pay by the day and then you didn't risk paying for when the weather was bad. So we needed to make it so that they paid more than their fair share of the operations and of the cost of many of, of maintaining the place um, so we raised the price significantly but up and i knew this was a problem for a few years but i did not want to discourage new people and if the price is too high i thought i might discourage new people 
So what we offer now is, you know, in the month of June, we're offering a free day visit. And we will give people who come for their first time often a 50% off coupon if they return. So we are encouraging trial by offering something now of even more value because the day visit is even higher than it used to be. Um, And we're encouraging the ones who are regulars and love the place to take out a membership. And we've had no resistance. Um, So going from about 40 something dollars to almost uh, 60, uh, a little, it's under 60, 50 something dollars, um, did not cause as much backlash I even expected. So that's how you have to figure out. If I'd asked people, do you want me to raise the rate? The answer would be no. But we saw that there's, the in, in what economists call price elasticity, that there was some room to grow that pricing in there. And also when you ask people, Apple knows very well. Apple knows that people don't always know what they want because they have never seen it before. So, you know, the Apple, the iPhone, the, uh, I have an iPhone, I have an Apple computer. Uh, when Steve Jobs decided to uh, revamp Apple and decided to make candy colored, uh, computers, I can tell you there was no research that said that people wanted computers that were fuchsia and lime, lime green and all these other colors he came out with. And yet those were incredibly popular and successful because of his insight and understanding that a lot of the existing Mac users and the people who were passionate about that brand were design people and they were interested in looks and and what it said about them as much as anything else. Similarly, uh, when Apple came out with the iPad, well, I had an iPhone and I had a computer. Somehow I didn't need, I didn't think I needed a third device. And yet Apple convinced me that yes, I needed to buy a third device that was neither a phone nor a computer, and it was somewhere in between, and yet I probably still still needed those other two items. So now I have three Apple items. So that's what, considering that your target market, your consumer, does not always know what they want. And in the services you offer within your club, your park, your resort, your camp, that's something you have to think about. And that's where you have to do trial and error, and to try to understand what things drive people, what things don't. Uh, what programs attract them. You know, it might be an event. People don't always know which events they're looking for. You try an event and one's successful and one is not. Uh, we didn't know how much demand there was for yoga, but yoga has become quite popular. A lot of the people who are taking yoga, I know, were not the ones who were looking for that program, but it was there, so they were interested in it. So if you want to target youth, I won't talk about that anymore here. We have two podcasts, which I'll reference in the show notes, where we talk about youth and youth talk about youth where we discussed what is the way to target them and the key to reaching them. This is about the marketing themselves. But no matter what you do, don't blame the customer. And that's in your target market and you're deciding what they want. The biggest trap I see people get into is blaming their customers for not wanting what you think they should want. You know what? Naturism is not the way it used to be. And if that bothers you that much that you can't adjust to it, then you should stop being in the business. Pass it to someone else or sell off or close the door or whatever it is. The days of people, for example, volunteering all the time, unfortunately, they're gone. We get a lot of volunteers at Bear Oaks. I'm not saying that. But there was a time where people had a lot more time to volunteer. Now people are willing to pay. Now people, when they come, expect to have a restaurant because they don't want to make food or a picnic at a time. It's it's too much work to make food ahead of time for people. Their lives are too busy or they're not used to it. They're not in a habit or maybe they're even too lazy. Lazy is a judgment. That not here to judge them. I'm here to provide a service that fits with what they want and that's what they pay for. And then in terms of your pricing, you were not selling the cheapest. You're not selling the least expensive, which is a terrible business to be in. You're selling what they want at a value and a price that they're willing to pay. And that's how you become successful. In the next part, I'm going to talk about branding. And branding is a very, very important part of marketing. And uh, the branding of naturism has suffered. The brand that is naturism is viewed by a lot of people now as old, fat, lazy, sitting around drinking beer. Uh, It's not 
it's not the image of naturism from a hundred years ago when it was all about health and thickness and sunshine and a better way to be. Now, some of that imagery from the hundred years ago, even the 60s or 70s, was driven by the exploitive naturist press and media that was showing only young people. But it is true, though, that at the beginning of this philosophy, it meant a lot more than it does now. Um, and there are lots of clubs where it is still a true philosophy of health and a better way of life. But unfortunately, there's also a lot of clubs that make it into the news that are nothing, that are just places where you can be naked and mean nothing. And you, you know, may even have some uh, swinging happening or laundry parties or things that don't seem to be consistent with any kind of nature's philosophy about rejecting clothes as a way of putting yourself above others or adding status or using clothes for uh, sexualities and stuff like that. If, you, if all that gets mixed up, the public sees these stories, they see the reports, and it confuses the brand of naturism. Unfortunately, we can't control the brand. We cannot control the brand of naturism. But you can control the brand of your club, park, resort, whatever it is, because that is your name, Bear Oaks Bear Oaks Family Nature's Park is the brand that we have been developing. And it stands for something quite intentionally. Because the brand is far more than the logo. People often think of the brand as in branding, as in a cattle branding, as just a logo. But the logo is simply the representation of the brand. Okay, I think the person who said it best um, is Michael Eisner. Uh, he was the CEO of uh, Disney for a long time. And he said, A brand is a living entity. And it is enriched or undermined cumulatively over time. The product of a thousand small gestures. There's a lot in that sense. There's a lot and it's very important. Enriched or undermined. And that's the thing. That's what we talked about. Naturism as a brand has been undermined over time. It takes time. Time's key. You cannot build a brand in a month or with one ad. You cannot destroy it either. But whichever direction you go in, you build momentum. And to reverse that momentum in case of negative brand attributes or negative brand experiences is a very difficult thing to do. It's a train and it's hard to stop it. And it's a living entity because it very is very much like a living entity. And um, let me, I'm going to play this clip describing BMW as a brand. Everybody knows BMW cars as a brand, but let's listen to them explaining their brand. Welcome back to Detroit, here on the BMW stand. Today's guest is Torsten Müller-Utrich, Senior Vice President Marketing BMW. Torsten, what is it that makes the BMW brand so special? Well, there are many things around which makes BMW special, but uh, take a look at our stand here in Detroit. You see, it's again very typical BMW. It's modern, it's exclusive, innovative, and also highly emotional. And as an example of how we define emotion, just take a look at the Z4 Roadster Coupe concept here in Detroit that we are showing for the first time in the US here in Detroit. Uh, another example are the variety of our M cars, the M5, the M6, but also, of course, the M3. Perfect examples for the highly emotional substance of BMW. So you see, it's about our human relationships. It's about, we have a relationship with a brand that we like the same way we do with a person. So the logo is like the face that you recognize the person, but the person is a lot more than their face and their picture. It is their personality. It is the experiences you've had with that person. With a brand, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, the more positive experiences you have with a brand, the more you begin to trust that brand. And if you heard in the BMW clip, they talk about emotions. They talk about feelings about the brand. And so trust is a feeling. It's really ridiculous. I mean, you know, people say they trust uh, a one car company versus another. I trust uh, Chevy trucks over Ford trucks. You know, 
General Motors is this massive company with tens of thousands of employees, and one truck is designed by a completely different team probably than the other team, and it's built by subcontractors, and, and you know, it, it's in, almost ridiculous when we think about it logically to trust a large corporations, and yet we do. We do based on our experiences. If we have bad experiences with a Chevy truck, and we have more problems, and we have bad experiences with a dealer, which is scary for GM because they're very dependent on the face of the dealerships. If you have a bad experience with a dealership, then you will hold that against Chevrolet if that's the brand you're dealing with. So the the components of the brand is, is things that make them like a person, that gives them persona, yet they're not a person. There are things like trust, loyalty, and connection um, that you make with a brand the way you do with a person. When you find a person you like because of their style, their personality, then they become your friend. And brands, in some ways, you can connect with them. People are very loyal to brands, Coke versus Pepsi or certain beers, because they also identify with them. It becomes part of who they are. It's very powerful. And the components of a brand are, of course, the product or service that you're providing. And that's fairly obvious in, in, in the case of naturism as well. It's also the target market or the customers. It's who's there, and that's where we get into the issue if all you see are older people and you're trying to target younger people. But it's also who you're talking to. Because in all the messages you're sending out there in your you know, online presence, as Felicity was talking about, and, and in your website and on Facebook and your advertising and your marketing in general, who you're talking to is creating an aura or an image around your brand and your target market, your customer. It's obviously the communication, it's what you say, but most importantly, it's the experience. And the experience is everything, and people forget that. It's, it's you know, what it's like in the washroom. It's, it's the invoice you get in the mail, you know? What does it say? How does it look? How does it make you feel? Every time you get an invoice that makes you feel bad, well, then you start to feel bad about the brand, or the brand has to make up for that in more in other things. You have to consider all these issues as you do your your marketing and as you're, you're planning your brand. So there's no detail that's too small. So let me just play this clip here from Michael Eisner again. Our willingness, our willingness to be leaders and ignore what the competition was doing extended to every level, even to the bathrooms of our ships and hotels. I'm sure many of you travel extensively and have taken showers only to be greeted by something like this. Your hair is wet, you're ready to pour on the shampoo, but the words on that little shampoo are so small, and even with your glasses on, and of course they're sitting you know, across the room, you cannot read what it says. Is it shampoo? Is it conditioner? Is it poison? What is in that bottle? Now, if you stay in a Disney resort, a cruise ship, or, or any of our hotels, these amenities, which even our far-sighted guests will be able to decipher, they can be seen. And when you get into bed, I insisted that there be lights that are actually bright enough to read, unlike the 25-watt bulbs that some hotels seem to favor. And it is annoying, you will admit. Let me make it clear when I, when I advocate this micromanagement. I'm not suggesting that one person should decide in a big institution all the ideas. Nothing can be further from the truth. Although I am pretty proud of those shampoo labels and reading lights. The key is to act on an idea, to see something that's not right and to say something to somebody, to do something about it, whether it's as big as a new business venture or as tiny as a shampoo label. When a book, when, a, when one of these great movies comes out, everybody says, oh, I had that idea, I had the same idea, it was my idea, I'll sue you. But the movie got made because one person, not that person, had the idea and then actually made it happen, knew how to function in a organization that could take a good idea and nurture it to completion. It's fundamentally about keeping your eyes open. And see, I love Disney World for that. At Disney, no detail is too small. And Bear Oaks, uh, Disney World is my model for Bear Oaks. Not because I want to be an amusement park, 
but because I want to reach the same level of attention to detail, because that's what makes Disney World. There's no detail that is too small. You heard Michael Eisner talking about their shampoo bottles and things like that, and that's the thing. You have to experience your club and your park from the eyes of people who are going there for the first time, which can be very difficult because we're so mired on a day-to-day basis with, you know, the pump that's broken or the toilet that's overflowing or the misbehaving guest in the back or whatever it is. We forget to step back and as part of our marketing and our planning to look at our park and see what are we missing. Just today I was at the park and I I needed some, uh, I was in my trailer and I had some dishes to do and um, I didn't have any soap, any dishwashing soap. And so I thought, oh, I'll get some from the store. We don't carry dishwashing soap. Oh, we should. We're going to. Tomorrow I'm going to buy some stock of dishwashing soap. Because the stuff that people are looking for, that's part of your experience. Oh, look, they have what I need. Our store is very well stocked. Not because we make a huge amount of money on this stuff, but because it's part of the experience. When people are having a negative experience because they forgot something, their razor, their comb, whatever it is, If we can fix that, we're improving their experience. We're solving their problem. When I was in Disney, I I will go through Disney World. I've been going to Disney World since I was a child. And I go through Disney World looking at it totally differently. It could be Disneyland as well, but California is a little too far for me. So when I go to Disney World in Florida, I I walk through and I I can just enjoy looking at how everything is put together. The cast members, as they call them, the staff there just appear. They don't, you don't see them going back and forth from work or having a break. Garbage never, you don't see garbage bags because they all disappear in the middle of the night. They have these underground passageways to maintain the, the, the experience, the, the magic of being there. And uh, if you look at the details, you know, in, in Adventureland, the garbage cans look a certain way. In Frontierland, they look a different way. In Epcot, they look a different way. They are designed, painted uh, to fit into the environment so they don't break the experience. They don't break the fantasy that is being built, the show that is being put on. I was in one of the restaurants um, in, uh, I think it was in Frontierland, and it was a nautically theme restaurant and everything was ship oriented you know and they were serving fish and all that stuff and as i'm sitting there eating my meal i'm looking around and i look on the wall and up on the wall is the emergency light you know every building has to have emergency lights and if you go buy an emergency light in almost anywhere they come in one color beige they're all beige and a beige emergency light especially tucked way up in the corner would have looked just fine you know nice clean new no problem Except this beige emergency light was not beige. It had been beige, but somebody made it look like wood. And so I went to look at it closely, and there's no other way to do this. It was hand-painted with a wood finish to fit with the wood uh, paneling on the wall. So that's an awful lot of detail. Somebody said, hey, we can't just put a beige light up there. And then they decided to get somebody to paint it. They had to find somebody who had the talent to paint wood grain on beige light. They had to get the paint and they had to get it done. That was probably expensive. But that's the kind of attention that Disney has. That means that your entire experience is reinforcing the brand. And they avoid all these little things. It's the little details that can break that fantasy of or experience that you're in and i want to do the same thing i'm i'm nowhere near that but you never stop you should never be happy i don't know how you could ever be satisfied that everything's perfect there's no such thing doesn't mean you're always mad at people it's not you know we is or yelling at anybody or trying to you know pushing people it means that you're paying attention as the leader as the marketer to always, always finding ways to improve the experience, improve the environment so that your guests have a better and better experience because that's what's selling and that's what your brand is. There's an individual called Terry O'Reilly that I used to work with. When I worked in the advertising agency world, he uh, he had a, a company, I think it was called Pirate Radio even at that time, and they did radio commercials. And when we were, uh, Mazda was my account and we did a lot of work with him. And he's a really brilliant radio, audio, advertising guy. 
And so a few years ago, he started creating a, uh, a radio show for CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, on advertising. And uh, it, it was called The Age of Persuasion. And if you want to, you know, keep thinking about how to market and how to speak to people and how others do it and get your brain going, this is a great show to listen to. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can go and listen to the archives because there's a lot of really great stuff there. And uh, he, of course, talks about branding. And uh, I want to play this little clip. Starbucks is another great experience marketer. Joseph Pine, co-author of The Experience Economy, puts it this way. A cup of coffee is only worth a few cents, but when packaged and sold at a supermarket, it is now worth 25 cents. If it's brewed and served by a waiter, it's worth $2. But if you are allowed to design your own coffee, it is brewed in front of your eyes, and you can enjoy it in the setting of a Starbucks cafe, it easily sells for $5. The experience of Starbucks, the coffee theater of Starbucks, makes a product worth more to the customer who is willing to pay a premium. Experience marketing creates word of mouth. It's someone saying to you, you have to experience this yourself. You have got to go. Mm. So you see... When you're selling coffee or whatever it is, but when you're selling something beyond just the product, beyond the the the, uh, the, the basics of of uh, a commodity, uh, you realize that you're selling an experience. As human beings, that's what we enjoy. We enjoy an experience. And is there any more powerful thing than naturism for being an experience? I mean, we we don't just like shake people up by changing their environment of our their vacation we shatter what they know we we do change how they look at things uh their bodies themselves others it it's an incredibly powerful experience it's so much more than just selling you know water hookups or electricity or dances on friday night we're selling something that is massive and we have to remember that in our marketing At Bear Oaks, customer service and staff is one of the most important things. We have a great staff, but we spend a lot of time doing customer service. Anybody who's listening right now who runs a club, whether you're owner or the operator or the manager, it doesn't matter. How much time do you spend with your staff teaching them how to handle customers? When you bring the summer staff in, when you have people behind the front desk, how much training? You may not be qualified to do it, and that's okay. You can find some. You know, there's... Customer service training, the, the, the interaction, it's the first people they deal with when they come into your place, is going to set the tone. You know, I said in the why clothing optional doesn't work, if the first person they see in a nature's club is a dressed person, you're setting an interesting tone. In our club at Bear Oaks, the first person you see at the front desk is nude because that's what we believe in. And that's what makes them both uncomfortable and comfortable at the same time. And what I mean by that is... It makes them uncomfortable because they're dressed. And it makes them comfortable taking their clothes off, which is why they came in the first place. If they came there to barracks to keep their clothes on, well, they should leave because that's not what we're about. Why the hell are they coming to our place for that? I mean, it's crazy. I keep saying that. People say, can I keep my clothes on? Why would you want to? 99.9% .9 of this world, you can keep your clothes on. Why are you coming to our place to keep your clothes on? Just to challenge us? I mean, that's rare. That's not what most people want to do. So Terry O'Reilly obviously agrees with me uh, in terms of Disney uh, because in one of his most recent uh, radio show, which is also a podcast, um, the newest show, after I think four years of the uh, Age of Persuasion, he started a new show called Under the Influence, which is a very similar theme, but a little broader in terms of marketing uh, discussions. And one of the more recent ones, he had Tales of Customer Service. And I want, you, I want to play one clip from that. The Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World is a model of customer service. This attention to detail comes, not surprisingly, from the founder. Walt Disney's mantra was, 
Give the public everything you can give them. From that simple statement, everyone at Disney strives to exceed customer expectations every day. MSNBC.com did an interesting article on Disney World titled, What Time is the Three O'Clock Parade? I'll explain that title momentarily. Customer service at the Magic Kingdom is both an art and a science. For example, Disney houses its lockers and wheelchairs to the right of the park's entrance, because they have long observed that the majority of visitors go to the right when they come through the gates. A Disney study showed that people who bought hard candy with a wrapper took about 27 steps before tossing the wrapper on the ground. So Disney put a garbage can every 25 steps. Another of their key philosophies is, it's not my fault, but it's my problem. Which means even though visitors may approach a Disney employee with a random question or a predicament, the employee is taught to own the problem and stay with the customer until it's solved. And when visitors ask, what time is the three o'clock parade? Disney employees are never sarcastic, but answer instead by saying, the parade starts at 3 p.m. at Frontierland, but it will be at Main Street USA by about 3.20. You can wait here in the shade if you like. Every ride, show, and train at Disney runs right on time. If the train is a second late leaving the station, the conductor gets on the speaker and explains why the train is delayed and how long it will be before the train gets going. Disney staff are trained to be assertively friendly. In other words, they are encouraged to seek contact with visitors. For example, they will actively approach someone who looks confused instead of waiting to be asked for directions. Disney's grasp of customer service was so exemplary, their customer satisfaction rating so high, that other companies began approaching Disney for instruction. So, in 1986, the Disney Institute was born. It's a Florida-based division of the Walt Disney Company that teaches other companies how to exceed customer expectations. Those companies have included Delta Airlines, IBM, General Motors, Chrysler, and even the IRS. The basic message at the Disney Institute is something that Walt Disney himself discovered decades ago that people remember people, not products. The key is to encourage employees to be consistently attentive without seeming overly rehearsed or robotic. For example, the Miami International Airport came to the Disney Institute for help. Surveys ranked its customer service among the nation's worst. Now, you might think that an airport and Disney World don't have anything in common. But when you think about it, both companies have millions of people waiting in line for a ride every day. And 400 Miami airport staff learned to put, it's not my fault, but it's my problem, into action. The Disney Institute's lessons are transferable to any industry. For example, a Chevy dealership in Massachusetts watched as their customer satisfaction levels jumped to 90% after studying with Disney. A staffing service company took the course and saw their revenues double in one year's time. A hospital in rural Wisconsin took Disney's customer service lessons to heart and its customer satisfaction scores soared to 90% and employee turnover dropped by half. And by implementing Disney's best practices, the Orlando Magic Basketball Organization introduced a new service-oriented culture to its staff and its customer satisfaction levels jumped above the 90th percentile. The list is endless. When customer service soars, so does profit. So if you don't know how to do customer service and you haven't trained your staff, and you should obviously because it's such an important part of the experience that people have, not just their first experience, but their entire visit, you can go to the Disney Institute. Uh, the Disney Institute is several thousand dollars per person, and it's for three, four, five days. Or you can do what I did. You can spend $20 or so, I think it was about $20, and buy a book called Be Our Guest, Perfecting the Art of Customer Service. I'll put a link. You can buy it on Amazon. I'll put a link on in the show notes so you can go and buy it yourself. 
And then that is the same material that they teach in the Disney Institute uh, for several thousand dollars. The thing is here is you have to be disciplined enough to spend the time reading it, making notes, and making your training plan based on that. But it's an easy read and it's a fun read. So, you know, if you want to learn a bit more about customer service, it's easy. Just go buy the book. So what do we do in our training? At Bear Oaks, that is. Well, first, the very, very first thing that we do is we talk about, with, and this is with every staff member, not just the front desk, but every staff member, the, the folks who mow the lawn, the folks who are out there, they're dealing with customers all the time. And their job is just as important from a customer service standpoint as the front desk staff. And that's what you see at Disney as well. I was once at uh, Disney and I went for a, uh, I, I rented a bike because I like, as I've said, I like to look around and I rented a bike and I'm biking around areas where guests don't normally go on bikes that often. I'm kind of going on a bit on the outside in the fringes. Not There was no sign saying I couldn't be there. It just was not typical. And as I'm passing underneath the monorail, I stop and say, oh, I'm going to take a picture of the monorail as it goes over me. I'm not there five minutes that a little Disney security van shows up. Obviously, they have got uh, surveillance equipment. And I'm going, oh, this is going to be interesting. Out comes a guy, Disney security guy. Now, I got to tell you, it's hard to be tough when you've got a name badge that has ears on it. But he wasn't trying to be tough. He was friendly. He said, hey, how's you doing? I said, I'm good, thanks. He goes, you know, we, uh, this was just after September 11th and all that stuff. So he said, you know, with all the... the problems in the world we have to be a little bit more careful and concerned so i'm you know it's a little unusual to see a person here what you know what are you doing here so i'm just taking pictures yeah it's no problem we love you taking pictures no problem but we just got to check you out make sure you're supposed to be here i said yeah no problem so where are you staying so i tell him show him my card he goes okay i just got to confirm that so he radios in and while he's waiting for a response he says yeah where are you from i go oh i'm from toronto he goes oh yeah yeah I have a friend who was, uh, lives in, uh, what is that called, Mississauga? And I go, Mississauga. He goes, yeah, that's it, that's it. And he starts chatting. And I'm realizing after a few minutes that he's interrogating me in a way that is incredibly friendly and fun and comfortable. Unless, of course, I'm a bad guy, in which case I'll, I would be nervous, but I wasn't. And, you know, after a few minutes, he's satisfied, he gets the answer he wants. He says, well, you know, I hope you get a good picture and uh, enjoy your day. I mean, that kind that that kind of training, I, I, you know, I wish all law enforcement people would learn that kind of training because I think it's far more effective because you let your guard down and you might say something you're not supposed to. But that's why I mean everybody gets trained for customer service and everybody gets trained about what we're about and what we're selling. And so back to my first point, the three, we, we tell every staff member, it's part of the staff manual that they get and they have to read when they first start, that there are three objectives at Bear Oaks, three business objectives, that is. Objective number one is the promotion of naturist values. That's what we're here for. That's what we're in business for. Number two is ensuring a delightful experience for our members and visitors, which is what we've talked about, the experience. That's what the brand's about. And number three is profitability, because we're a business and we have to make money. And then I emphasize that it's in that order. And why is it in that order? Because if a guest, as we said before, wants to come and keep their clothes on, we won't allow that because our first objective is the promotion of nature's values. Why? Well, we have to maintain an environment. People come to us, the vast majority, because we are a naturist environment. So... If we allow people to keep their clothes on and, I don't know, do things that are inconsistent with nature's values and, and philosophy, then, of course, that breaks the experience, that breaks the fantasy, if you will, of being in a naturist-only world. You're, 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 you're shattering the glass. We're trying to create this, you know, quite truly abnormal environment abnormal because it's not at all like the real world people are coming to us because they want to break from that you know if the whole world was naturist and open and we didn't have to worry about it then there'd be no reason to do this but we are creating in a place like bear oaks and this is true of any naturist environment you're creating something special something different and so it is a bit of a fantasy because it is not real the real world is what they're trying to escape that's why we've created this environment and so when if you don't fight to maintain that environment then you're shattering the, the the experience. You're breaking it, and and it, it's not as 
positive or powerful of an experience, and it hurts your brand. So the, the a delightful experience, the insurance a delightful experience for our members' visitors, does not take precedence over the fact that, well, first and foremost, we are doing the promotion of nature's value. And similarly, profitability is not always the first consideration. So, and an example for that is we do things inefficiently. If we're halfway through a project and the day's over, we put everything away and we close things as much as possible, which just means in the morning we have to bring everything back out again and open things back up. Why? Because we are, again, you know, if we were Disney, you wouldn't even see it because we could somehow hide it in the backstage. We don't have that luxury. But we still try to maintain when the guests are there during the day the the, 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 perfect, the perfect environment. They don't want to know about us having to fix the septic system. They don't want to know. They don't want to have to see the things apart and bits and pieces everywhere. I mean, as much as possible, we put things back together and take them apart again. It's not efficient. When we do garbage, we don't just leave garbage bags everywhere. The garbage bags get tucked in one corner, and then when they're all been assembled, then they all get taken out to the bin. Uh, we don't leave garbage bags laying around while we wait for something to be picked up. We try to hide that practical stuff as much as possible. It's not profitable. It would be more profitable to do it in an efficient way, but that would take away from the experience. So that's why they're in that order. Now, they're not extremes. I mean, they're not... Uh, they, they're not black and white or absolutes, I guess is the right word here. Obviously, um, everybody would have a much more delightful experience if I provided a butler at every single campsite. But that would not be cost effective. People wouldn't want to be paying for that. So there is obviously some give and take and some adjustments. There's a limit to everything. But it's important for people to understand, for your staff to understand when they make decisions you know, do I do my job the most efficiently or do I make sure that this customer has a good time? And hopefully after our training and understanding our priorities, they will ensure the customers has a good time, even if it slows them down a little bit during the day. So the power of all this is the emotional connection so that they get loyalty, loyalty to your brand and to your club. And if you do, the power is they will forgive mistakes and you will become very hard, if not impossible, to compete with. The true emotional brands have no competitors. Uh, the inverse, of course, is a negative image, which is challenging to overcome. And unfortunately, we have that, as I said earlier, with naturism and its image. But at Bear Oaks, we're building an image of a naturism, the Bear Oaks way, if you will. Like the Naturist Living Show is is part of that. We have an idea. We're trying to reinforce it. And that's what we talk about it in the in Naturist Living Show. And that's why we created the show. We're trying to be more than just a park. And so we're building a strong brand. Most people now uh, have heard probably if they're into naturism about Bear Oaks. It's fairly, at least in the English world. The word, the word's gone now. We've, and that's because we've had articles everywhere. We've been in magazines. We're on the internet. We're everywhere. It's part of the marketing communications and the advertising. And we're going to get to that later. So you have to ensure a consistency of your message in your branding. And if your brand is naturism, as it is with us, we ensure that everything fits. And so we don't have lingerie dances. I don't know why people want to have lingerie dances in naturist clubs. I'm sure it's a lot of fun. But it really, the imagery goes against that. We had some members from the previous club, the previous to Bear Oaks Club, the one we bought, who they used to have a leather and lace dance. And the first thing I did was say, no, that's not happening anymore. And I said, well, nothing happens. There's no sex or anything. It's just fun. It's like dress up for kids, except for adults. So well, I'm sure it is. I believe them. There's no reason not to believe them. I'm sure it's a lot of fun. But that's not what we're about. You know, we are a naturist club. And the image from the outsider is terrible because they will assume something is happening. And secondly, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with the brand. It doesn't fit with the image. It doesn't fit what we're doing. We People can go and have a leather and lace dance at their house or they can go rent a hall somewhere else. It's just not consistent with what they are. Just like, you know, swinging. I have no problem with people want to do that. I, I don't get it myself, but if that's what people want to do, that's fine. But you can't connect it to naturism because it's not naturism. It, the two have nothing to do with each other. 
And in fact, if they, they often do get connected, unfortunately. And that just reinforces the general public's belief that you can't just be nude without sex. You got to keep those things separate. Single women come to Bear Oaks. I had one just a couple weeks ago. I think I told a story in a previous podcast. And they come and they stay because they're comfortable. They come because they read on our website and they hear on our podcasts and they see in videos or whatever it is what we're like and it gives them a sense of comfort. And when they're there, they're very comfortable because we truly have nature's values and we are truly about respecting ourselves and others and it's something that people want and there's a whole episode on the the show on uh, women and naturism and i won't belabor that point but only by building a strong brand and and a strong philosophy around who we are are we able to do that as well as we do so don't let your business operations hurt your brand remember that don't let them hurt you either remember that you're not in business to operate water plants or pools or septic system. You're in business for naturism or whatever. Perhaps you're listening to this and you're not even in this business, but marketing is the same for everybody. Remember what you're in business for. Sometimes the small problems just drive you nuts and, you know, it makes you crazy. And, you know, um, one of the examples is, you know, you go, have you ever been to some place and there's a sign that says, keep this area clean? Well, whoever put that up has lost. They lost because the, the, their experience, their customer experience is being driven by the operations. It won't work. You know, the people who make a mess, they don't care about your sign. And the people who care about the sign, they didn't need the sign in the first place because they already probably kept the place clean. Everybody knows you're trying to keep the place clean. So the sign is just pollution. It's a little insulting to the user. And it takes away from the experience. It suggests that there's a problem with cleanliness in the area or with people being unclean. I bet you if you actually did a survey, you know, whatever the problem is, but let's take problems in the washroom, that 99% of people are not a problem. Usually it takes just one, one person. But because as operators, as managers, as, as people who deal with this stuff all day, day in and day out, because we only see the problem, sometimes we start to see everybody as being the problem. We have to always remind ourselves the problem is not everybody. The problem is a very, very minute percentage. And we're handling them so that for the majority, they don't have to deal with the problem so that the majority has a delightful experience. So I think I will bring Terry O'Reilly one more time to give a what I think is a pretty perfect summary of what branding is all about. In this world of abbreviated marketing messages and campaigns designed to last weeks rather than years, advertising and marketing have shifted from long-term relationships to a series of speed dates. While I do believe that in the era of the MTV effect, audiences can take in a lot of imagery in nanoseconds, but that's not the same as persuasion. Persuasion takes time. As ads get faster, and as people are handed more ad avoidance technology, I think marketing that involves experience is good, in that it slows the process down. It invites people to engage and interact with multiple touch points to multiple senses. It's a lesson taken from the experiential brand giants, theater, the movie industry, novelists, the tourism sector, and one of the mightiest among them, Walt Disney, who turned amusement parks into branded adventures. Brand experience creates impact, giving people a memory that can be stored and retrieved. When you think of a brand, the feeling of a great experience washing over you, that is marketing nirvana. The time may be coming when you no longer buy groceries. Instead, you experience them in the age of persuasion. Now let's talk about advertising. As I said at the beginning of the show, advertising and marketing are often confused. And marketing, we've talked a lot about now. We're going to talk about advertising. 
And advertising is how once you've determined all of your marketing components and you know who you are, that's how you get your message out. So John Wanamaker uh, is credited with this quote. He was a U.S. department store merchant uh, from 1838 to 1922. And according to the uh, lore anyway, he said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. And that's very true. In order to succeed in advertising, you have to just keep trying. You have to see what works. I mean, it's obvious when it works because you're getting more people. Thomas Watson, who started IBM, said, if you want to succeed, double your failure rate. Because if you don't try, in other words, you're never going to succeed. You're never going to get anywhere. You're never going to invent and discover what works. So advertising is all about getting an appealing message to the right person, right? So as I said here, there's two components in that what I'm saying. There's the message, what we're going to say, and there's the right person. And that's the target group. And I'm not going to go back there because we talked about that in extensively earlier in the, this, this show. So uh, we understand what the target group is. We've determined who our target group is. So now, what is the message to them? Presumably, we understand our target group. So now our message is going to be tailored to them. So with the message, with the advertising, there are two key components, reach and frequency. Reach is means that you get your message to them. You reach them. But just reaching them once is not enough. You need frequency. You need to reach them many times. Uh, marketing, advertising, it, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You, you, you have to take time. People who don't understand often say, well, I placed an ad and I didn't get any response. Well, one ad doesn't do it. You know, in the case of Bear Oaks, almost everybody says they come to us because of the internet. Well, I'm sure the internet's probably near the end, but here's how it probably works. They might drive, we have signs on the highway, uh, and they might drive by to and from work and they see the sign on the highway and they just see the Bear Oaks name. And then they see a, a listing in a directory they picked up, maybe one of those uh, booklets we're in that talks about things you can do on the weekends or campgrounds in the area. And they remember, that's the place I see on the highway. And then one day as they're driving back and forth to work, they're listening to the radio and they hear an interview about Bear Oaks because we do a lot of PR and a lot of media. So finally they say, you know what, I'm going to look into that because I keep seeing their signs on the highway. And they go to the web and they find it and they learn more about it, but they still don't do anything because, as we said earlier, this is a very high involvement decision. It's not something you make very easily, at least most people. So then, suddenly, because you went on the web and maybe you signed up to be on the mailing list or you've decided that you favored it, uh, the Facebook page, you find out there's a promo or a special events on a weekend, volleyball tournament, something to give the person the excuse to come. So then you visit, right? So it's, it's the combination of many, many different touches, many different points to build the awareness. It's the reach and the frequency. And in that message, always strive to sell the benefits and not the features. And the benefits of naturism, well, you know, they're, they're everywhere. People are not coming to Bear Oaks because we have a pool. The pool is nice. That's why they, you know, that's why they stay. That's why they enjoy themselves. But they're coming from far more than that. But even if you were just a regular campground or park, you still wouldn't sell the pool. You would sell the experience, the relaxation, the fun, the pleasure that you have when you visit the place. You want an evocative message. That means something that stirs the emotion. And fortunately, you know, for Naturism, that's incredibly powerful. You can talk about the mess that the world is making. You can talk about uh, how you can get away from the over-sexualization of the human body, the objectification, the uh, incredible reliance on fashion and rank and style, the impersonal nature of the world. I mean, and, and that's the negative thing. You really want to focus on the positive. Naturism solves these problems. Naturism gives you a positive experience. So let's talk about medium. The medium is, now that we talk about the message, where are you going to put them? 
Well, you have the traditional ones. You have print, you have broadcast, you have outdoor. Um, you know, some of it you still need to do. You, you still need brochures. People like to take things away. We get visitors all the time. Now, can we, can we take some away? They pick things up if we leave them in places. But most of us can't afford to be doing television advertising or outdoor billboards or any of that. Um, you need, because you, you, you can't just buy one ad. You can't buy one billboard for one week. You can't buy one television spot. You need frequency. So that's not a practical one. But start with your basics. Start with the easy stuff. Make sure you have nice brochures that people can take away that explain who you are. Uh, make sure you have nice business cards. Make sure you have your basics, you know, your website and all that stuff. Start with the easy stuff. Consider then using promotions as well. Do added value offers. We already talked about how we offer free first time for trials. You can try discounts. You can try contests. What's your objective in a promotion? What are you trying to do? You know, we're offering uh, high value cash prizes this year because for the top volleyball team because we're trying to bring higher talent. A high cash prize is not going to attract the novice people because they know they don't have a chance. But by having higher talent and better volleyball to watch in between, it gets the younger ones, the, uh, uh, the more novice players, all excited about the sport and maybe they learn something and it adds more energy. But to attract everybody, we offer that if you organize a team, the organizer plays free. Try to encourage people to put a team together. So don't just get one, get six or seven. By far, though, the most effective tool is PR. And I don't understand why clubs don't use it more. I mean, they do such basic press releases. We have an open house. There's so much stuff to do, you know. In, press picks up three different types of stories. News, controversy, and human interest. And it's so easy to come up with stuff like this. Like last year, we had a heat wave. So I sent out a press release that we had free free visits for first-timers to get away from the heat. Well, the best way to beat the heat is to take your, not have to wear any clothes, that kind of stuff. Um, do, did a press release about the fact that most people in society suffer from fear of nudity, gymnophobia. We did a clothing drive. We did a press release about that. They don't all get picked up massively, but every year one of those gets picked up massively, and every release gets picked up at one point or another. It's free advertising, and it's more effective than advertising because people listen and pay attention to the editorial content far more than they do the advertising. The downside is you don't control the message as much, but if you're good at the interviews, and that's something you can practice, or you can find somebody who's good at it, if you're good at interviews, then you can manage that message and you can make sure it's done. As I, I always say, though, is I do all media interviews. I don't care who calls. I don't care how negative they're planning on being. Because if I don't do the interview, then they will still do the story without me. At least if I do the interview, I have a chance to win the reporter to my side, make sure they understand my point, and a chance to say what I have to say. Sometimes it doesn't work out. But I would never say no, because saying no doesn't get you anywhere for sure. It's guaranteed. And as part of PR, don't forget your community relations. Uh, you have a lot of uh, people in the area. You hire the locals, join the local chamber of commerce. Part of that is to get business, but part of that is to make business easier because we are well-known in our community. We are great supporters of our community because that's how um, we get along. That's how we ensure that there's no concerns. You know, If they don't know, if we're a very secretive society, they'll make up their own stories and they'll be a little bit uh, leery about anything we need. So when you need to expand, when you need to get an authorization, or when you need to do stuff, the stories will get out and you might not get what you want. You know, it's not, it's no longer in a world where they'll tell you to your face because we're far more subtle about it. But it's the fact that things just don't happen the way you want them to. I also join all kinds of associations, not just naturist associations, although I I believe that everyone should support a naturist organization and association somewhere. I've said this before. These folks are often volunteers who are promoting our brand, who are promoting naturism. And if we don't support them, nobody will. You may not agree with everything they do, but at least they're trying. And if you support them, then you get to have a say and hopefully influence them a bit. 
but other association. We're part of the camping association. We're part of a bunch of tourism association, local business associations. Not only do we learn and, and meet people, but we help promote naturism in areas that aren't traditional naturist clubs. I'm not trying to, again, market to existing naturists. I'm trying to market to people who will be interested in naturism but are not there yet. And there are tons of those. Our surveys suggest that, and our success proves it. Events. I think events are also very important because they help encourage trial. People need an excuse. You know, they may be planning on coming to your club, and they've been planning for two years. They just need an excuse to come. Some people have success by doing open houses, free days. Um, sometimes they it's a tournament, like we're doing a volleyball tournament. is a great trial opportunity for people to try, come in. Um, it can help with PR as well, uh, because when you do an interesting event, you can do a press release. And they add value to your customers. I mean, uh, you were talking about places being boring and nothing happening. Well, if you have events, if you do special uh, contests and festivals and, and tournaments, then that adds interest and value to your customer. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be a horseshoe tournament. It can be a mini golf tournament. You can make something out of almost anything. Even a kid's weekend doesn't have to be complicated. Kids like simple games. Parents like it when you make their children happy. But finally, the, 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 I'm leaving the, the most important today to last because online is where you have to be. And we're right back to the beginning and what Felicity said. We need, you, you need to be online. You must have an excellent website, not one that just shows your basic features, but really talks about who you are because people, again, are not trying naturism because of your swimming pool. They want to know what you stand for. They are slightly suspicious because they've heard that really it's just about sex. And so you have to repeat that it isn't. Remember, everyone who comes for the first time is new. They're learning. You may have said it a thousand times, but that first timer has not heard it. So you have to say on your website. There are endless free directories out there. Want to list them yourself? You just go and you sign up and you list yourself. I do something online I do something every week. I add myself somewhere. I do an improvement somewhere. I do a little something every single week. And I've been doing it for six and a half years. It builds up. It's like putting a dollar in a jar every day. At the end of a year, you have $365. It builds up. One doesn't make a big difference. Every directory helps with your Google rankings. And if Google, I could do a whole show about Google. They have so many features, so many different things they are offering. In fact, very shortly, you're going to see that you can take a tour, a Street View tour of Bear Oaks on Google Street View. Uh, that was a service I contracted this year because I think it'll make people more comfortable. Uh, it'll be able to see where they're going before they get there. It's not because that's really the problem. It's because when people are nervous about trying naturism because they're nervous about taking their clothes off because it's been beaten in their head that it's wrong to take their clothes off and emotionally they just can't do it. Sometimes they need to have all the other concerns that are simple handled. It's a nice looking place. It's a clean looking place. Okay, I can go and I can bring my spouse so it's not a problem. They need to see that. We need to address these things. We need to talk to them nicely and know they won't have a bad experience. Really, the issue is the nudity. But the excuses come from everywhere else, and you have to help address them. And I think Google Street View will help with that. But there's all these other Google features. You know, our blog is through Google. The Naturist Living Show website is done through a Google uh, blogger site as well with a custom URL. Um, it's endless. I mean, if you search for Bear Oaks, though, now, after all these directories, after all things I've done, um, for example, did you claim your listing in Google? You know you can have a free place listing. It's free. There's no charge. You just confirm you're the owner or the manager. They do it through a phone card or ma they mail you a postcard for free. And then you're confirmed and then you have the power to control what's on there. And then they allow you to put pictures and videos and all kinds of information and pricing all free. When you do that, of course, you show up on the map and that improves your ranking. So all that social marketing as well that I do through Facebook and Pinterest and just look on the bottom of the page of the Bear Oaks website. You'll see all the places that we're involved in. All that combines, especially after six years of doing it, to give us incredibly high ranking. So if anybody types in the words naturism in Toronto, because we're near the city of Toronto, 
nudism in Toronto, nudist, naturist, or Ontario, we are in the top three listing every single time. Top three. I didn't pay anybody to do that. We did that through a lot of effort over time. And you, as the listeners, helped because many of you have shared and commented and you keep listening. The downloads, the links, the clicks, it all adds up. Social marketing. As Felicity said, you've got to do it. It's very important. You may not understand it. That's okay. Find somebody who does. Who, by the way, is not necessarily your teenage son. Your teenagers are users of technology that does not make them marketers. Just because they wear running shoes doesn't mean they know how to build one. To be an expert in marketing and an expert in social media is a skill in itself. And it's not necessarily a young person. So make sure you find people who actually understand social marketing in order to do it. It's not about technology and it's not about being a user. You'll note that I've talked mostly in this episode about branding and about the target group. Then that's because if you understand the person that you're trying to reach and influence, and remember, we're a niche, so we're not trying to reach everybody. So you need to understand that small group that is key to who we are, that small group that is so passionate or will become so passionate about naturism that you'll never lose them. I mean, that's a very powerful business advantage. Never mind that we're trying to promote a philosophy here. You have to succeed in this world because... It takes money to survive and it takes money to keep going. So you have to have a successful business. So if you understand your target group and if you've developed a strong brand, if people come to your club or your resort or your park and have an incredible experience, then selling it will be obvious because the marketing of it is is all about creating the service in this case and targeting it to the right people. The advertising, the message in your advertising will flow out of that. Plus, of course, you want to make sure that when they finally come, they're not disappointed and they have a fantastic experience while they're there. So if you understand your brand, if you develop a strong brand, if you develop an incredible experience and you know who you're talking to, the message will be obvious. So this was a long show, a lot of points, a lot of discussions about marketing and advertising. So for today, that's more than enough for this episode of The Naturist Living Show. So thank you for listening. Thank you for sticking to the end of this particular episode. My name once again is Stéphane Deschain, and I'm your host for this podcast and the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. You can find links to all the items we talked about in the show uh, in the show notes on the website at naturistliving.bearoaks.ca. That is B-A-R-E, Bear Oaks, O-A-K-S, dot C-A, because we're in Canada. So keep sending your suggestions and your comments. I received a number of suggestions of things I uh, wanted to include in this show, but I decided because it was going to be this long, I will save it to the next show. So this one is strictly marketing and advertising, and that's it. So uh, some of these other things that you guys have sent me will make it into future shows coming up next month or two. But I really appreciate getting them, so keep sending them. The show's email address is naturistliving at bareoaks, that's again, that's that's B-A-R-E again, bareoaks.ca. So join us again in about a month for the next episode of The Naturist Living Show. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. Traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca. Thank you.